the unbearable weight of massive talent, the Nick Cage movie that is essentially about Nick Cage. But not, but kinda, we'll get there. Also, I finally found the sweater, the one from High School Musical, the musical, the series. I own this now. This, this is who I am as a person. So Nicolas Cage has had an interesting career and life to the point that him being a Coppola is like the least interesting fact about him. Yes, for those who did not know, Nicolas Cage is the nephew of famed director Francis Ford Coppola and somehow changing his name to that of a comic book character slash composer to dodge nepotism is one of the least interesting things about Mr. Nicholas Kim Coppola, now Cage. Yes, his middle name is Kim. He was at one point broke and owing the IRS money after spending over $150 million on things like a dinosaur skull at an auction house that he then had to return to the Mongolian government and never got his money back for it. A live octopus, shrunken heads, burial tombs, a two-headed snake, multiple yachts, dozens of cars and motorcycles. But the major cost sink absolutely came from the 15 properties that he purchased, including a island in the Bahamas, a haunted mansion, and two European castles. Why two? I don't know. So if you're wondering why Nicolas Cage was in a slew of trash movies and direct-to-video roles in the 2000s, gaining a reputation so notorious that he was on the receiving end of this iconic college humor skit, that's why. The unbearable weight of massive debt. But he's still committed to the performance in every single one of those shit shows, regardless of what people think. And after a while, he built notoriety out of those performances. Going from enjoyed to mocked to beloved for his unusual acting methods and behaviors. And a lot of that love is unironic with roles like Big Daddy and Kick-Ass, Mandy, and his most recent Oscar snub, pig. And all those performances, the good, the bad, the wacky, have amalgamated into this movie where Nick Cage plays Nick Cage with a K. Really, uh, really pull a fast one on us there. But it is really basically about Nick Cage, but also not really at all. It's a concept, not quite a honey boy, but also not a full representation of his life because this is not his wife or daughter. Neil Patrick Harris is not his agent and Pedro Pascal is certainly not an eccentric crime boss and Nick Cage uber fan that we know of at least. And so much of this movie really works then a lot just doesn't. For me at least. One of my friends described it as an extended family guy bit, and yeah, that feels pretty accurate, uh, the good and the bad. Sometimes it feels like it does really understand what it's doing with the legacy of nature of Nick Cage, letting the absurd fly high while still injecting it with the wholesomeness required to sell things on an emotional level, acknowledging the type of career he's had and why he's had so many wild projects just not necessarily for the correct reasons. And that's not to say I hated it by any means. I had a great time watching it uh, for the most part and there were parts I, I genuinely loved. It just, it hit a significant lull for me. I think I'd probably give it a three to a 3.5 out of five depending on my mood, but it has succeeded in making me appreciate Nick Cage even more. In a lot of areas, it really highlights the passion he has for the craft of filmmaking and film in general. And the moments that focus on that are the ones that really shine. He recently didn't ask me anything on Reddit and, and like so many that just keep cycling back to whatever someone's trying to promote. Nick answered the questions earnestly and in a way that there was no denying that it was him. It was nice and refreshing. It really just drove home how much Nick Cage actually gets it, showing the value that he has to the world of art. And I think ultimately that's what his legacy deserves. But you know what we all deserve? A good night's sleep on a comfortable mattress worthy of Nicolas Cage himself. And the best way to do that is with today's sponsor, Birch. I'm on a bed, if you couldn't tell. She's cozy. Birch is a premium mattress in a box company making products that are stylish, comfortable, and made with non-toxic, organic, and natural materials that are all sustainably sourced so they're better for you and the environment. Other than providing great lumbar support, Birch mattresses are created with breathability and cooling in mind with increased airflow for your premium comfort. I deal with a lot of allergy symptoms that can make it hard to get a good night's sleep. So knowing that Birch mattresses are made with hypoallergenic wool, making them both allergen and mildew resistant is incredible. And on top of being good for me, they're good for the environment. Birch makes sure that the materials they use are produced and harvested sustainably. The wool used in the mattresses is sourced from New Zealand farms that are wool integrity and Z compliant. I struggle a lot with getting a good night's sleep and I felt like my last mattress was like freezing when I'd get into bed and then I'd wake up in the middle of the night in like a sweat or with some kind of back pain because it wasn't providing me enough support. 
With Birch, my sleeping temperatures felt a lot more regulated, leaving me feeling more rested when I wake up because I wasn't just sinking deeper and deeper into the mattress with no support while overheating. Now, a mattress is a pretty big commitment. You spend so much of your life sleeping, so it's important to get the right fit for you. And that's why Birch offers a 100 night sleep trial along with a 25 year warranty. If you don't love it, they come right to your door to pick it up and you get a full refund, no hassle. And if you like free stuff, and honestly, who doesn't love free stuff? Each mattress comes with not one, but two of their Eco Rest pillows delivered right to your door. They're made with recycled plastic bottles and still feel so plush and cozy, wow. And if you live in the US, all this is delivered right to your door for free. So if you're looking for a new mattress and wanna find out why I love my Birch so much, make sure to head on over to birchliving.com slash Jedi or click the link in the description down below to save $400 off your mattress plus two free pillows. So where did this movie go wrong for me? And again, I don't mean wrong to imply that I hated it. It just hits a distinct moment where it lost a ton of steam for me at least. The movie was really hellbent on adding in this like action plot and I just hated it. I I'm not opposed to the idea of action being included in general, because obviously I would expect that. I just don't like the direction that they took it. I get the desire to show off a little something from every genre Nick has conquered in his career, but it just could have been better in that plot department. If you want it to be driven by a plot, you, you gotta make it good. I'll get into the specific details of that in a bit, but I really do feel like a lot of your enjoyment of this movie is gonna hinge on whether or not you enjoy that aspect of the movie. And I felt like it started off super strong. I love so many different elements of the story, the buddy comedy between Nick and Pedro, which is also Nick's favorite aspect of the movie. Then it just really torpedoes all of that. It just ends up feeling super generic, and that is incredibly unfortunate, especially when we're talking about a Nicolas Cage performance. I get that they wanted this to feel like it was more open to general audiences and like a wider audience, but that doesn't mean you have to provide people with like a bland story to accompany it. I do think a lot of people are gonna love this. A lot of people are loving this. And I definitely feel like I'm in the minority of my opinion here, even though a lot of my friends have been giving it fairly mixed reviews. I just feel like Nick Cage is too good for this movie about Nicolas Cage. This man has insane range and a range for being insane. He is just one of the most unique performers we have. I think the word idiosyncratic is the one that I keep getting seen used to describe him in a lot of areas and I think it says it the best. It's why he rose to fame in the first place, his over the top, fully committed performances, even in his more subdued roles where he like barely has any lines or doesn't have any lines at all. He's still just as committed and has this flair for claiming the screen. For all the bad that you you can say about different performances in some of his movies, a lack of effort and care is not typically one of them. And I'm not trying to imply that he phoned anything in with this movie either. And his performance definitely stands out in a lot of areas and Pedro absolutely shines in this. It just could have been so much better. The movie is still an enjoyable watch. I think it really points out the beauty and the effect movies and media can have on people and specifically the legacy of and love for Nicolas Cage. I think this would probably be the perfect drive-in movie now that I've actually been to one, like you can shout out which references are happening on screen when they're not directly mentioned. Really get into it with the people you're watching with. Even the theater experience is great as long as you're with a good audience because you can all laugh along. And honestly, maybe not being completely sober would probably help. The whole kitten caboodle. <laughs> so let's just get into like the light setup of the movie. No real spoilers here if you've seen the trailer, but I just don't really think this is something you can spoil if you're on board for watching a Nick Cage movie where Nick Cage is Nick Cage. Like, you know what you're in for. I'll also break down the different Nick Cage references I noticed at the end of the video. So again, this isn't based on complete reality. This is a fictionalized combination of various aspects of the myth of Nick Cage pull together. The director is specifically a fan of neurotic Nick Cage, so that's what he wanted to shine through in this performance, uh, but that's obviously not what Nick Cage is all the time. So Nick gets to juggle playing a character that's close enough to himself to feel exposed, but also this exaggerated version that exists in like a semi-fictional area. So Nick says he's kind of like still recovering from the role and self-described the experience as cool but trippy. Early on, he even suggested someone else playing him because he didn't want to do it, but that's clearly not what the creative team had in mind. And they were probably right to, to stay strong here because one of the clips that ends up getting used the most that extended like Nick fucking Cage was all him apparently. It was written as Nick effing Cage exclamation point. We called action and we got that. He looked at us and said, 
I wanted it to be transcendent. The general premise is that Nick Cage, in a moment of desperation to pay off his mounting debts, accepts the offer of a wealthy superfan to attend his birthday and tell stories for one million dollars. But everything gets thrown out of whack when Nick Cage obviously gets recruited for the CIA to help with an international operation, forcing him to channel some of his most iconic roles. And it's really that entire CIA part uh, that loses it for me. Guys, I'm just not a fan. Again, we'll get there. So if you really just don't want to know anything beyond this, uh, this would probably be the point uh, where to hop off. Otherwise, let's jump into the insanity. So we're going to break the sucker down, talk about what I liked, what I didn't like so much, but just know that ultimately, if you're someone who's interested in the premise of this movie, if you've enjoyed the varied career of Nicolas Cage, you'll at least have some laughs and maybe even have a stellar time. So the movie itself doesn't actually start with Nick Cage. Well, kind of. It starts with two people watching Con Air and just gushing over how Nick Cage is the best best actor that's ever lived. Before the girl in the two gets knocked out and kidnapped and absolutely not where I thought this movie uh, was gonna be starting and I don't know how I feel about it as it goes forward, uh, but it's fine. Which is where we cut over to Cage himself who like in real life has grown a reputation of acting in a series of less than stellar projects. And instead of it being stated that it's for debt purposes, it's literally just painted as, it's my job, I'm an actor, I act. No one criticizes other people for doing their jobs all the time. Which, fair point, but while each Nick Cage performance is a baby to him, uh, and there are many movies he's turned down, not every Nick Cage movie was made uh, out of the purity of art. So like real Nick, this Nick has a passion for the craft of film, but he's constantly at war with a younger version of himself, Nicky Cage, inspired by a 1990 version of himself from The Wogan Show. I gotta give you my wild at heart t-shirt because... <laughs> The Cage that doesn't care about the art, only the star power. Because Nick Cage isn't a character-driven drama guy, he's a star. He will ultimately go on to kiss this young hallucination of himself. That is the kind of movie we're working with here. But Nick is desperately trying to get a role in a new movie by director David Gordon Green, someone he had previously worked with on the movie Joe all the way back in 2013. But despite his passionate impromptu audition, he doesn't get the role. Which sends Nick into a bit of a breakdown, only compounded by being informed that he owes about $600,000 on the hotel room he's been renting since separating from his wife, getting kicked out of that hotel room, and getting drunk and embarrassing his daughter at her sweet 16 party after a pretty shitty therapy session with her. So he decides that it's time to quit acting. But not before taking one last offer to attend a birthday party of a wealthy superfan in Spain so we can pay off those debts. Is Javi going to want me to, uh, you know, and if Javi... I am Javi. Nick Cage. And that super fan is Javi, played by Pedro Pascal, who is shockingly adorable for a 47-year-old man. And no, he doesn't just want to suck Nick Cage's dick or have Nick Cage suck his dick. He's just a genuine Uber fan. And their dynamic is just so much fun. Once they get past this initial awkwardness and in Nick's misery, they're thick as thieves. When Nick is just completely ready to fall in and collapse on himself, Pedro Pascal gives him the most sincere pep talk on why Nick can't quit acting. Stop! Sorry, but you can't quit acting, you can! That gift brings light and joy to an increasingly dark and broken world! And the big reason he's brought Nick over to Spain is so Nick will read his screenplay and maybe decide to be the lead actor in it. Honestly, not the worst way to spend a million dollars. However, as Nick landed in Spain, two CIA agents see him getting off a plane owned by one of their targets and quickly nab Nick off the streets to convince him to spy on Happy for them. Because they believe that Javi is the head of a criminal organization that kidnapped the girl from the beginning, the daughter of a presidential candidate, so that he'd be forced to drop out of the election. And this is right about where I start losing my utter glee at the movie. Even though Nick doesn't believe that Javi has it in it to kidnap anybody, because by now they've bonded over their creative interests, their favorite movies, and Paddington too. I cried through the entire thing and made me want to be a better man. He still agrees to help, because what if it was his daughter kidnapped? And he's Nick fucking Cage. And even though I really just don't like the direction with the CIA stuff, I think it's annoying and dumb with some really weak acting, there is still some highlights and a lot of fun moments. The CIA specifically results in one scene where Nick 
Nick accidentally drugs himself and almost dies, but all it takes to get him to wake up and dose himself with the antidote is someone yelling, action? Cause nothing stops Nick Cage from a performance. He's a professional. He just doesn't believe the CIA has the right guy, but he's still willing to stick around and try to figure it out. So to stay at the compound longer, he says he would like to write a movie with Javi. And this is where it starts feeling a little bit like one of other Nick Cage's top movies, Adaptation. It already had the vibes with Cage occasionally acting across a younger version of himself. But in terms of how it relates into the plot, as Javi and Nick are writing their story, each element they choose to add to their movie becomes reflected in real life until it ultimately does become the movie that they wrote. And it is a good idea, it's just the execution fell flat for me. Again, where this movie shines is in that buddy comedy. Even when Nick thinks that Javi might be guilty, it always swings back to something fun. And it's like really sad that at one moment they're having a conversation where they're like, yeah, I just hate conversational comedies. There has to be something to drive it forward. A conversational comedy would have been significantly better than this. And if they had felt I don't know, like a little bit more self-contained in a way that there's a bit of a plot going on, like a clerks or something. This could have been so nice. But in terms of fun stuff, there is the Nick Cage shrine, which I definitely saw coming. Is this supposed to be me? It's grotesque. I'll give you 20,000 for it. So things continue to escalate. Javi brings Nick's family to Spain to help him work through an emotional block, but Nick thinks he flew them out there as a threat because of a CIA report. But as expected and hoped, Javi is innocent. It's his cousin Lucas, the real head of the crime family who's been manipulating elections. Javi's just been forced to be the face of the organization after his father's death, which is why the CIA thinks he's in charge. I. No, but Lucas has discovered that Nick Cage has been working for the CIA and for Javi to prove that he wasn't in on it, he needs to kill Nick Cage. I'd like to see you fucking try Pedro Pascal. Nick Cage is the new, who's the guy with the Bowflex and the roundhouse kick? Well, it doesn't matter because Nick Cage is way more badass than he is. Chuck Norris. Anyways, at this point, Nick thinks that Javi is guilty and planning to kill his family, so he's gonna have to kill him first. And Javi thinks that Nick was there to betray him the entire time and needs to kill him to save his own life. But of course, these two are just way too good pals to let a little murder get in the way. They just exchange shoes. I don't wanna kill you. You're the last person I wanna kill. I love you. I love you. So they make up, but uh, Lucas clearly didn't believe that Javi had it in him to kill Nick Cage, so he sends his men off to kill them both, which is when Nick truly needs to tap into his career abilities. You are a faster runner than me. No, that'd be the stunt department. Not according to the making of feature right. There's a couple of other times where this happens too, like when Javi made Nick drive when they were high on LSD looking for artistic inspiration because he did all of his own stunts and gone in 60 seconds. They do manage to get away, but by now Nick's daughter has been kidnapped too and his CIA agent friend Vivian says he just needs to get to the locations she sent and they can try and figure it out. Except she's been forced to say this by Luke Lucas's men after they already killed Baron Holtz here. Okay, the CIA are literally trained not to do this, and these are like international operatives. This is dumb. Either way, Vivian sacrifices herself so Nick and the gang don't get jumped. Like, could have just told him not to come to the location, but okay. But they concoct a plan to save Nick's daughter Addie and the other kidnapped girl Maria Delgado. Nick will disguise himself as Sergio, a long missing mob boss, so he can infiltrate Lucas's compound. And they do, Nick Cage uses monologue powers to distract Lucas long enough to get the upper hand because he's Nick motherfucking Cage. He has to pull an epic getaway with the gang. Maria realizes that Nick Cage saved her life after she was kidnapped while watching a Nick Cage movie, so that's a trip. You could ask Kate? Fucking cool. Then, as they're making their harrowing escape, with Javi and his second love, Gabriella, first being Nick Cage, of course, doing their best to distract Lucas, the movie we're watching becomes the movie that Nick and Javi were writing as they drive into the U.S. Embassy. See, it's basically adaptation. The movie then cuts to applause as it cuts to the premiere of the movie where Javi is finally living his filmmaking dreams. But instead of the after party, Nick Cage chooses to head home to spend time with his family, finally learning the true value there instead of making it all about himself. Which from what I can tell is very dramatized. Uh, obviously actors can have mixed availability when it comes to being around their families, but Nick seems like someone who did a lot to be there for his kids around work. Not the best luck with wives, but at least from what I can tell publicly, he's a good dad. And I don't really love the ending. Like I absolutely love that Javi succeeded, but I just think there needed to be some kind of major plot shifts here. But that's pretty much the movie. Uh, it never really gets 
it's boring. I do think it gets bland in a lot of areas with how generic uh, the plot being progressed is, but there are a lot of laughs, a lot of fun references to his career. It's just like so many moments are up, 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 up. And then I'm just kind of thinking back on how it, like what actually happened. And it just brings me down to more of this level. And that's really unfortunate. In terms of references, sometimes it's not even directly to the movies. It's just like mythos around things happening while he was filming movies. Like when he established a new acting method known as Nouveau Shamanic, which was around the release of Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. So a lot of those interviews have like him talking about it. Today you're called psychotic if you do that. Look into it. It's fun. Other references, some of which I've already mentioned, are Con Air, like in the opening clip, and the bunny in the bunker. The Wicker Man at the end of the movie with him yelling, not the bees. Not the bees! Ah! The younger hallucination, Nikki, is wearing a Wild at Heart shirt, which is why he's like absolutely channeling that Wogan show performance or appearance. The Rock is playing on his plane ride to Spain. The CIA agents mention Moonstruck, Face Off, and The Croods 2. Yeah, I made that movie with Emma Stone. Javi will later say that Face Off is his favorite movie of all time. Captain Corelli's Mandolin is the set Nick met his in-movie wife on. At a low point, Nick walks into a pool and sinks down to drink his beer, which is from Leaving Las Vegas. Guarding Tess is the movie that brought Javi and his father close together before his father's death, part of why he has such an admiration and love for Nick. Gone in 60 seconds with the driving stunt comments. Javi's Shrine to Cage has a variety of props from like pretty much all of his movies like Raising Arizona, Mandy, National Treasure, Lord of War, and of course the life-size Nick Cage with face-off golden guns. National Treasure is directly mentioned when Nick and Javi are trying to escape Lucas's men with Javi saying that he knows Nick can reach the Jeep first. I saw how fast you were in National Treasure. I will point out though that he goes with him because Javi is a true hero. Adaptation comes into play in a few different ways as mentioned. I'm sure there were a lot of other references or things in mind for different aspects of the movie. And I know that for his performance, he drew on different aspects of his own career. I also know there's a lot of stuff that was filmed that Nick Wish had made it into the movie. Like apparently there's like a lot more scenes with Nicky and it seemed he was really excited for that dealt with like Dr. Caligari, but it didn't. So I guess we'll have to see what the deleted scenes bring once this gets a full release. So yeah, I don't fully know where I stand with this movie. I, I wanted to love this with unbridled delight and assumed I would, but God damn, the back plot is just not good to me. And like aspects of the family plot line is just not good for me. It really pulled, pulled the wind from my sails. I do still think the movie is worth a watch if you're interested in it, because I'll think back to some really funny moments and I'll still kind of chuckle to myself, which is, it's why it's just some of this moment, some moments were like a five out of five and then other moments were like a two out of five. So it kind of evens me out somewhere in between. If you're not a Nick Cage fan to any capacity, I don't really think it'll be the movie for you. And I don't know why you'd be interested in it beyond maybe like meme potential. Unless you're a huge fan of Pedro Pascal because yeah, he's an absolute delight in this. But please let me know what you were thinking in the comment section down below. Explain to me why you love this. Because there is so much to love. The humor was really fun for me and it was rare for a bit not to deliver. It's almost upsetting how strong this movie started and I think it could and should have been way wackier. Because sadly, all of those like amazing moments and nuggets between Pedro and Nick just get turned into this really generic and kind of bad CIA action plot. But that is going to do it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel. If you're new, leave a like on the video. If you're into that kind of thing, hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later. I'm surprised that worked. You're a tasteless asshole! What? Ah!